Good afternoon from Denmark. And uh, if you're in North and South America, good uh, morning. If you're in Asia, good uh, evening or good, ni good night. If you're in some other place, wherever you are, welcome to the uh, webinar five. Webinar five is uh, systematic and reliable chemical product design. And I will be giving lectures one and two. So let me again uh, uh, point out that uh, this PSC for Speed uh, webinar series 2021 is being organized by the, uh, the Thai office, Bangkok office uh, of PSC for Speed. And uh, what you see on the screen are the different people from the Bangkok office who are who have been organizing it. And also in today's uh, problem solution presentation, Ora Koch and Siripon will do the presentation. As you have already seen, if you have participated in uh, any of the uh, webinars before, uh, this is the fifth webinar of the 2021 series. Webinar one was a three-part series uh, on 14, 15, 16 of July. Webinar two was on 27th July on property estimation. Webinars three and four were in August. Three was on refrigerant design, four was in sub chemical substitution. And we are on the fifth in September now, which is on systematic and reliable chemical product design. What you will see is that also uh, this uh, webinar and also webinar six have a lot to do with webinars one, two, three, four, all of them, because uh, we will need property models. We will need a solution of uh, uh, equations for design for synthesis. We will need uh, refrigeration design, which is a sub problem of product design chemical substitution, which is a sub problem of chemical product design. So all of these that have been, we have been presenting before are somehow connected uh, today in webinar five and the last one on 16 September webinar six. And also to point out that uh, uh, the, we are putting the recorded videos on our YouTube channel and you can see this uh, link from our website uh, where you can click on subscribe if you want to subscribe and then you will go directly into the YouTube channel and you will see the recorded videos there. If you also do not want to go to YouTube but uh, want to download, uh, then you just scroll down without subscribing and you will see the form where it says, uh, you can download the slides and so on. So I hope uh, those who are involved with education, teaching, they, can, they are welcome to use uh, this material, but please acknowledge our input. Uh, those who are uh, studying, I hope it can give you some extra information other than what you will learn in the class and courses. And those who are in industry, I hope it can give you a lot of additional information uh, through which you can solve your problems. So we are hoping that uh, we can contribute to the communication and service to the community. Okay, so let's start with uh, today's webinar, Systematic and Reliable Chemical Product Design. The objective of this workshop is to give the participants a view on various aspects related to chemical product design, their sustainable development, as well as their application. Sustainability of modern society depends very much on chemicals based products that are used from the time a person wakes up in the morning to the time the person goes to sleep. In terms of current challenges and opportunities, issues related to integrated 
product process design, modeling related to product properties and functions, methods to find novel, innovative and better products are very important. An integrated model and experiment-based design approach employing a systematic computer-aided framework with built-in design templates is necessary. And this is what we will also highlight. So in this webinar, methods for systematic and reliable product design will be highlighted in terms of first in lecture one, background theory, product classification, problem definition, solution approaches. And then in uh, lecture two, uh, chemical product design case studies. And then uh, there will be a um, invited speaker. I will tell you about that uh, in the next slide. And also there will be demonstration of our software pro CAPD, uh, which will solve different types of chemical product design problems. Use of a systematic uh, approach will play a very important role. So as I said, <clears throat> I will give the lecture one and lecture two. The first one is uh, more like an introduction to chemical product design. And the second one is where I will highlight uh, different case studies related to single molecule design, blend design, formulation design, and functional products. Then Professor Andre Bardo from ETH Zurich, uh, he has kindly agreed to give uh, uh, a lecture on CAMPD, computer aided molecular product design methods based on PC Saft and quantum chemistry. And then the last lecture by Ora Coach and Siripon from the Thai office will be problem solution using pro CAPD software. Okay, so let me start with uh, then the introduction to chemical product design. And before that, uh, let me just point out that there is a, a large number of um, books that can be, that are used these days as uh, even textbooks for chemical product design courses. And I've not listed all of them, but uh, some of them are there, including this uh, one where I'm involved, where half of the book is related to product design. There should be, I didn't uh, list it, but there are two, um, special issues of the Journal of Com Current Opinion of Chemical Engineering. Uh, one came out in 2020 and another will come out in 2022. Both of them are collection of uh, papers on chemical product design. So they will be very helpful to you if you want to have a wider uh, opinion on chemical product design. So let me start with first uh, some definition of terms. So on the plot, you see that uh, I've put both process development and product development. On the x-axis is the development time. On the y-axis is the design activities involved, all development activities involved and could be regarded as scope. So often the question is which one comes first, the process or the product? As you can see here, you need a process to make a, one needs a process to make a product. So unless we have a product to make, we don't really have a process. So in my opinion, I agree with this uh, figure that is taken from Professor Kaying, that the product design and development comes first, and then we need a process to develop that. Some definition of terms, design, according to us, uh, and here I'm including uh, in many of the statements, uh, Professor Kaying uh, from University of Hong Kong. Um, design is a part of synthesis activity. Development includes management of all activities in the development process from concept, conceptualization of ideas to their realization. Product design refers to design activities related to defining the product. What to make, that's a product. Process 
Design refers to design activities related to designing the process for manufacturing a specified product, how to make, that is. Successful realization of a product includes product development as well as process development. So you can see that uh, the webinar series 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3 is very closely related to what I'm talking about today or product development. So now let's define the process design problem and product design problem. So what you see here is this, the standard uh, process design problem. Um, if you look at uh, that, we have all the errors that are going into the process flow sheet box. These are information we know, raw material. We want to convert some raw material to some product, but we do not know what is the process, what are its operating conditions, what are its equipment parameters. So all the question marks are what we try to find out in process design. And as we have said already, that we need a process because we want to make a product. So what is a product design problem then? The product design in similar way, if you look at the arrows coming into the box, uh, product or molecular or mixture design. And what we want is a product with desired properties. What we don't know is which is that molecule or which is the mixture of molecules. We know some product functions, but we want to find out the molecular, uh, how to synthesize the molecule, how to synthesize the mixture. So that is the product design problem. So if we design a product, then we need to connect it with the process and that's the integration of process product. But in a lot of cases, people actually forget that this process that we are talking about is for the manufacturing of the product. But product also has an application process. For example, if we take a drug, does the drug work? If we buy a, a hairspray, does the hairspray work? That is not the process that you see on the left. So that is an application process. And so, we also have a product and then we need to know, we want that product to have a certain function. And then we need to know what is the application process by which we can confirm that function. So, so what is the application process? What is the application con conditions? What are the equipment parameters that are related to the performance of the product? And therefore, the product performance is closely related to the product function and the product properties are closely related to the product process that will make that product. So both are important and both need to be looked at when we want to design a product. So as I said, it is important to understand therefore the product process property relationships and a very typical example also is solvent where the process flow sheet is a process to make the solvent, but the application process is another chemical process where the solvent, for example, is used to separate, let's say an azotropic mixture. So in the top, we have a chemical process to make the solvent. At the bottom, we have a chemical process where the solvent would be used. Similarly, the refrigerant. We need a refrigerant process where the refrigerant would be applied. On the other hand, if we take a drug for our health, then the application process is our human body. And the process flow sheet is the process that will make it. So there are different application processes and these need to be understood. So now let's see chemical engineering. I put just chemical engineering, but it's chemical, biochemical and related engineering, uh, both 
um, <clears throat> products and processing start with raw materials, as we talked about, and you can see on the left, the raw materials. And then we have traditional manufacturing that give us intermediate chemicals or bulk chemicals. These are single species products. These then are combined to make consumer products, functional products, and many other things. And then these are after use, rather than throwing out, now it has become important to reuse. So we need advanced manufacturing to get back some of the raw materials so that we can recycle. So now it is a question of recycling and reuse. And so a question of sustainability and circular economy, if it is possible. I would say what is possible is sustainable circular economy because ultimately the amount of recycle we can do for each raw material will be decreasing until there won't be anything left. So some examples of products, single species molecular products like sugar, starch, refrigerant, um, nanomaterials, carbon fiber tubes, uh, some aggregation induced emission molecules and many more. So these are just single molecules that perform a single function or some cases multiple functions as in the case of lipids or surfactants, but these are single molecules, okay? Then the next product is uh, blended or formulated products where in principle, the product has more than one uh, chemical and the, the phase of the chemical can be a single phase like a liquid, can be an emulsion, um, and uh, it can also be solid uh, in some cases. So there are different ways to, to develop these products, but the most common ones are emulsions and liquid products. And we will see also that how to make these ones because this is not one chemical, a number of chemicals. So that is in a way mixture design rather than molecular design. And each of these products also have a function, like in the case of paint, it has to, uh, as the name indicates, give a coating on, on a surface. Uh, if it is a cosmetic, like a lipstick, it gives a coating on the lips. Uh, adhesives has function, ink has function, skincare. So they all have functions, but they are formulated because they are a combination of uh, chemicals. And then other functional products where chemicals are involved, like in a, in a bag of potato chips, on the inside there is, a, there is a layer that keeps the chips fresh. Uh, there are some mosquito repellent kind of uh, uh, devices. Uh, it could be called devices, it could be called functional uh, products because uh, with the heat, uh, vapor comes out and the vapor keeps the mosquitoes away. So it is the design of the entire pr product where the vapor is keeping the mosquitoes away. So these are in a way also called functional products. And then devices are more like um, water filter or air conditioner uh, air purifier rather, those are kind of specific devices that perform a specific function. But in uh, the common thing in all of these is that there is, uh, there are chemicals involved and that's why we call it chemical product design. We are not talking about TV, um, television or car or things like that, because uh, those are not chemicals based products all the chemicals may be used. So here is a classification of the products then. We classify them as single species, which can be small, like refrigerant solvents, can be large, like active ingredients, 
surfactants, membranes. Then the idea of these ones are that these are single chemicals. Their cost of production usually is high. The, the basis for design is a chemical process. Is there a chemical process that can make it? The risks are feedstock availability. Do we have the raw materials to make it? Uh, the, some of the challenges are also, uh, is it profitable? It's very important. The cost of production is very important. So all of these has to do with also the cost of production. And of course, all of them have issues like environmental impact and sustainability. The formulated products on the other hand, as I said, is a blended, is a mixture of chemicals. Uh, it can be blends like liquid blends. You mix different liquids together and you mix them. So key factor again is cost and product function, what kind of function it is. Another thing in this case is uh, time to market, speed to market, that the earlier we can take it to market, the better it will be for the community as well as for the design. Basis is blend properties and stability. If we are selling a product which is liquid, it's supposed to be one liquid phase. The challenges at this moment, uh, most of it are still trial and error approach, but more and more computer aided techniques are coming in. Functional, it's the same thing. The only difference is that in this case, it is not a clear liquid. Uh, as in the case of detergent or personal care or health, cream, things like that, uh, these are emulsions. And uh, in this case, the microstructure plays an important role in terms of the function of that product. And uh, a measure of satisfaction is the consumer satisfaction. And it is also trial and error. Um, there is not much uh, engineering science and knowledge is more by expertise and practice. Device is uh, like fuel cells, microcapsules uh, for drugs, uh, microcapsules for control release uh, and other devices. So they are also mainly by trial and error. Okay, so these are the different kinds of products. In this uh, lecture, one and two, I will mainly uh, concentrate on single species and formulated products, which are bo both blended and uh, formulated. And the main reason for that is that's where most of the data models are available. And so computer aided techniques can be developed. In the area of functional and devices, it's more trial and error. So the stages of a chemical product design and development would be that we start with a market study. So as if you had taken the previous uh, webinar, in webinar four, we talked about chemical substitution. So chemical substitution is not just that there is a hazardous chemical in the product. We can do a market study and we could find out that uh, there is a product in the market, but it is possible to develop a better product and a more cheaper product for the company who would then do the business. So market study is needed. Based on the market study, some parameters would be defined for a product. So for example, one could say in the market, there is a hairspray that costs $10. But if we change the formula by this, by adding these chemicals, this will be a better product and it will be cheaper. And if, we can, uh, and if we can convince the consumer that this is a better product, they will buy it. So the market study will define the product design character uh, requirements. Then a prototype will be made. And based on the prototype, if everything is fine, then feasibility study, detailed uh, process design and economics will be made. And after that, if everything is passed, then the engineering design plan scale up, and after that, the product launch. So these are basically the steps 
For some products, this can be very fast. For some other products, this can take a long time. Like for a pharmaceutical product, like a drug, it can take up to 10 years and it can cost approximately 1 billion per year. So if we can save even one year out of that 10 year development period, we are talking about a lot of money to save. But for some other products, it can be as little as six weeks. So it depends on the product. So with that as a kind of a short introduction, <clears throat> I will now give you some theories on the single species and mixture blend design, which is computer-aided molecular design, computer-aided molecular and mixture design. So <clears throat> the problem can be formulated as we are given a set of target properties, that is the theta. We want to find molecules that match that target properties. So that's the product attributes. The product attributes are defined in terms of properties with given values. What we have to find out is which molecule or molecules match those properties. So of course, we can do by trial and error, we can take some molecule, calculate its properties and check, but that will take a long time. And it's trial and error. It can be blind trial and error. We do not know if we are going in the right direction or not. So, <clears throat> and also we can see that uh, uh, depending on the size of the molecule, the problem also scope and significance of the problem changes. If the molecule size is low, the value of the molecule is uh, usually also low. If the molecule size is uh, uh, small, then uh, it is quite easy to find those candidates. If the molecule size is low, small, then because uh, the price, the value is low, we have to make quite a lot to make a profit. On the other hand, if the, it's the opposite, if the size is large, then the value is quite high. So in some cases, uh, you can, if one makes just one ton of a very large complex molecule that can be used in some special drugs or something, just one ton per year is enough to make a huge profit. So, <clears throat> and because uh, the production, uh, the price is very high, the production rate is quite small. One doesn't need to make the same amount one would make, for example, of methanol. So if one makes, what you see on the right is a vitamin. If one makes that vitamin, it doesn't have to be the, the same amount as a low molecule product like methanol. And finding the candidates is difficult because there are too many alternatives to look at. So the question would be then, how many molecules can be generated when there are uh, 30 carbon atoms as opposed to when there are three carbon atoms. So the number of combinations can be quite different. So that's why they are difficult. When it comes to mixtures, it's very similar in problem formulation, except that in this case, we say that we already have molecules, that is chemicals. We still have a set of target properties but because a single molecule cannot match these target properties, we need to mix them. So then the question is, out of the molecules that we have, which molecules should we take and what is their composition that will give us the target properties that we want. So in principle, uh, the formulation, the problem definition is very similar, except that we are not talking about single molecules because single molecules are not able to satisfy those target properties. So what we need in this case is a method to synthesize mixtures. We need mixture property models. We need to evaluate the performance of the product. And we could also optimize the, the product in terms of its cost, because if we know the cost of each chemical, 
and the compositions they have in that mixture will tell us whether the mixture is the lowest combo, lowest cost mixture or optimal. So mixture design a problem uh, are what kind of problems can we find in the in our world? We can see that petroleum, for example, crude oil, uh, not the crude oil, but the products of crude oil like kerosene, diesel, gasoline, naphtha that is coming out of the distillation, crude distillation, edible oil that is used for cooking, polymer blends, paint formulations, lotions. These are all liquid blends. And therefore, is a very interesting problem with wide application range. So we can also see from this figure, on the left, we have the molecular design. We designed the molecule, and this is a molecular design. And uh, up, we need to find the optimal molecule or a range of molecules. And once we have a range of molecules, we can do the blend or formulation design. And these molecules and these blends together can be used in devices and functional products. So we start with the molecule, then we go to the blend mix and uh, mixture. And not all mixtures are final end products. Some mixtures are used in other products like devices and functional product for their final use. So all of these then are characterized by product need. So why do we need a molecule like this? So if it is a solvent, we need a solvent to dissolve a solute. Then why do we need a formulation like this? Because we want a paint and we want to coat, we want to protect our wall or wood, so we want a paint. Why do we need a functional product like a detergent? Because we want to clean our cutlery, our, our clothes, so we need a detergent. So this is the product needs. Now, with these ones, we cannot solve a problem because uh, these have to be converted, the, the needs have to be converted to properties. So, what is a property related to dissolved solute is solubility. What is a property related to cleaning is bioactivity of the active ingredient that can break down the dirt. What is the, bio, uh, the property to protect is uh, drying and evaporation rate of the um, drying of the, of the paint on the wall and the evaporation rate of the solvent. Those two will deliver the coating on the wall. So that's the properties required. And then having the property is not enough because if we just say solubility is not enough, we need to say, what is the value? So we need to give the product property bounds. We need high solubility. We want liquid state of the solvent and so on. Detergent, we want to break the dirt totally. Uh, paint, we want to deliver the pigment on the wall. So these are then the bounds that are required. And if we know these properties and these bounds, then we are able to formulate a mathematical problem that we can solve, which you will see later. So now let's see that if we want to develop a computer-aided molecular mixture design, what kind of methods and tools we need. Because we are working with molecules, we need a representation method to represent and generate molecular structures. And because we need to predict the properties uh, of the product, we need a database with data. We need property models if the data is incomplete but property models will evaluate properties. Some properties, as we have talked about, that properties are related to a behavior of the product and also a function of the product. Function is related to application, 
and behavior is related to the design of the product. So we need both property models for function evaluation as well as for its behavior. And then after we have the property models and we are able to represent and generate molecular structures, we need to screen alternative. If we end up with finding 50 alternatives that all match the required specifications, how do we choose? So we need a method for screening of alternatives. Okay, so these are the three main items that we need if we want to develop our own computer-aided uh, molecular design or mixture design tools. So representation of the molecule, you can see we can represent a molecule by its chemical formula, by its structural description, by bonds, by conjugate occurrences of different bonds, by connectivity index, by groups. And you will see that we have chosen groups and the reason for choosing groups is that we need also property models uh, which are predictive and the only predictive models that are available and work better than any of the others are the group contribution based. There are models <clears throat> with bonds, with conjugates, with connectivity indices, but they're not as widely applicable as with groups. So if we have groups, then that is the representation of the molecule. If we get a molecule, which groups are there in that molecule? So in that way, the structural description here is in terms of groups. So here are some examples of groups. We can call them now the molecular descriptors. And then the question is, with these groups, how do we generate molecules? So some examples of molecules I'm giving you here. But <clears throat> if I say that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we have these seven groups, how many molecules can we generate? If I don't give any other constraints, I would say millions we can generate because there's no upper or lower limit on the number of groups we can use or how we will combine the groups. So unless we give some additional constraints, there can be a combinatorial explosion that we can have millions of groups. And if we want to do it by hand, we can see that uh, by the time we probably write 10 of the molecules, the computer will generate hundreds of them or thousands of them. So that's why this is computer-aided molecular design because the computer will be able to do this faster than us humans. So what could be the rules that we can put in order to avoid the combinatorial explosion? One thing could be that we put the groups according to class and category. So in that table, you see that CH3 is class one and category one. What does class one, class two, class three mean? Class means how many bonds it has free. So CH3 has one bond free, CH2 has two bonds free, CH has three bonds free, C has four bonds free, okay? So immediately we can say that if we know the class, we can know how many groups can be in a molecule with those kind of groups. So with a class one group, we can only have two group molecules because there is only one bond free. With class two groups, if we have one CH2 group, we will need a three group structure. But if we allow two CH2, then we can have four group structures. So it depends on how many class two groups we will allow in order to fit the size of the molecule. Similarly, we can work out how many groups can be for groups with three classes. So classes tells us which groups to combine and the size of the groups. And then the category that you see defines which groups can be combined with other groups and which cannot be. 
So category one can combine with everybody. So they're free. But categories two, three, four, five, they are restricted. So for example, OH cannot join with OH. It must join with a hydrocarbon group. So if we put those criteria also, we can come up with a much lower number of molecules that we will generate. But are they going to be chemically uh, feasible and stable? Will they, will they satisfy the chemical uh, chemistry requirements? So that's when the valency and octet rule comes up that these equations that you see, this one and this one, if they are satisfied, then the chemistry rules for bicyclic molecules, monocyclic molecules or acyclic molecules will be satisfied. This tells how many, what is the maximum number of groups that will be allowed in a molecule uh, in between upper and lower bound. And this uh, tells <clears throat> what is the size of the molecules, uh, the, the different types of molecules. And uh, sorry, this is the different types of molecules. Um, this is for each type of molecule, what is the total number? And this is for each type of molecule, it has to be between a uh, lower and upper bound. And then this is, uh, for some specific molecule, whether we can have, uh, how many we can have in that molecule. So these are different criteria that we can <clears throat> add to the, to the case. For example, here we can say that uh, there can be uh, two CH2 groups. There must be only one OH group and the total number of groups in the molecule will be five. So then we, we set, look at these and then we set, look at these to check if the valency or octet rule are satisfied. To give you an example, let's take ethanol, CH3, CH2, OH. The number of bonds, free bonds for CH3 is one, CH2 is two, OH is one. So if we put it in this equation, we get it equal to two. And Q is acyclic. Ethanol is acyclic, so that is satisfied. So now you can see that uh, this expression, giving this expression to the computer, the computer can very fast take the groups, combine them, check this equation and tell whether the molecule is feasible or not. So that's why this is very useful for computer-aided molecular design. <clears throat> Now we have the generation uh, representation and generation. We need property models. And uh, if you have taken the core webinar two, then property models, uh, I've talked about that. We have talked about that before. We have the pr primary properties, then secondary and functional properties, then bulk mixture properties, and then phase equilibrium properties. For all of them, we have models for the primary properties and the phase equilibrium properties. We have group contribution, but the others are not. So once we form the molecules, we can check the primary properties, then the phase equilibrium properties, and then we can check the temperature dependent properties and bulk mixture properties because they are not uh, group contribution. And then some special properties, like if we are looking for solvents, then solvent power selectivity. If you're looking for refrigerants, then some refrigerant properties. Those are some special properties that we need. The property model need to be predictive and qualitatively correct for the synthesis design stage, but needs to be quantitatively correct when we are trying to verify. So verify is like experiment, so it needs to be correct quantitatively. But when we are doing synthesis design, it needs to be qualitatively correct. So if we say that solvent one is better than solvent two, it should be. But by how much, we cannot say. So now we can represent the problem mathematically. We have the objective function, 
with respect to cost, with respect to other criteria. Then we have the four different types of properties, primary, secondary mixture, uh, bulk and mixture equilibrium. Then we have the synthesis, uh, the S is the octet rule for molecule and B is the process flow sheet. So we have the structural constraints. And then finally, we have the process model. Putting all of it together, we have a complex mathematical problem that we want to solve. Note that in every problem, all these equations do not have to appear. Uh, we could solve a problem only with the primary properties and the molecular structural constraint and no objective function. So that is possible. So another one, we can just take the primary and the mixture equilibrium properties and process function and the molecular structural constraint that is for solvents. So different combinations of these will give us different problem formulations for different kinds of products that we will need to solve. <clears throat> so here is a very simple example of uh, the generate and test. Even if we have formulated a mathematical optimization problem, we can solve it in many different ways, including looking at the, at the database. For example, if we just say that uh, our target properties is L1 uh, with upper and lower bounds, we do not need to generate molecules if we just go to the database and find out 20 molecules that satisfy these constraints. So the database already has the property, so we don't need the property model. It already has the molecule, so we don't need the molecular structure. But if we do not use the database, then we need to generate the molecule and therefore we need those equations. And we need to calculate the property, therefore we need the property models. So here we say that we want to, uh, we want to find a solvent, which is a very good solvent like benzene, but does not have the carcinogenic properties of benzene. So then we can say that, uh, well, uh, aromatic compounds, hydrocarbon aromatic compounds can be carcinogenic. So we will not make aromatic compounds. We will make acyclic molecules and we will have only carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So then from environmental health safety related issues, these will be already taken care of. So then we take uh, groups with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen that can make acyclic alcohols, ketones, aldehydes, ethers. And then we take these and then we generate the molecules with the rules that I have indicated to you. And then these rules give a molecule like this, but this molecule can be, can be represented in two ways. And then we calculate the properties of these two with our group contribution property models. And then the ones that satisfy the requirements are, our, are the molecules that we are looking for. So that's how, uh, um, let's say, a CMD method will work. We can do it by hand, but we can generate maybe three or four molecules. By that time, the computer will generate thousands and we'll have tested thousands. So that generate and test can also be done with the computer and you will see in the later in lecture four application of it. The same ideas can be also uh, adopted for polymer design. The only difference between a polymer and a molecule is that in a polymer, it is not a complete molecule. There are two free attachments. So let's say we want to find a polymer where the glass transition temperature, the density and the water absorption compared to our desired value, the difference will be the smallest. And these are the groups through which the polymer could be generated. So the workflow is exactly the same. The only difference is the property models and the data flow because of the different property models. So for polymer properties like glass transition temperature, density, water absorption. These are the models, the group contribution models. Uh, the contributions of, of these groups are given here. We put the group, 
the contribution and we calculate the property just like in any other. And here you see an example of a polymer. There are two bonds free. So we need to change our uh, structural parameters, uh, structural constraints to allow two free bonds in the equation. And then once we have done that, these are the property equations. These are the structural equations. These are the groups. And we can exactly in the same way solve the problem. So the solution steps are the same as I said, but the models are different and the data are different. And this is the same in all cases, all kinds of products. So now we have talked about basically the conceptual method, the background for the conceptual method in terms of representation generation of molecules, and then uh, property models, and then mathematical formulation, and then solution. So now we have put that all in a framework, which is called computer-aided modeling framework. In the top is the preliminary design, where we define the product need, and convert the product need to properties and convert the properties into the mathematical formulation. Then once we have formulated the problem, we try to find out what should be the solution strategy. Once we have solved it, then we do the evaluation and verification. And this picture you will see in many slides. <clears throat> this is to highlight that we are not forgetting experiments. We do model-based synthesis computer-aided, but we also value the experiment. What we are saying is that we can do in this way very fast, generate candidates, and then we do focused experiments to find out which is the better. Or we do experiments to help with our models and parameters. So experiment is very important, but we do not suggest to do blind trial and error experiments. We generate very good candidates with our method, and then do the experiments on the best candidates. So for prelim uh, preliminary design to get the data, we need to collect product requirements and convert them into properties. So one of the questions is that, what product do we want to make? Why do we want to make? How do we want to make? So it can be because uh, we want to compete globally against all others and come up with a better product, or maybe a product does not exist. So market survey will tell us <clears throat> which is the product we need to make and what are the needs of that product. And then once we define the product needs, we need to convert that needs into properties. So for example, flammability is related to flash point, solubility to dissociation time, solubility parameter, uh, ease of spreading is viscosity, Wettability is contact angle, and so on. So now, how do we get this kind of information? This is very painstaking search of the literature and getting the information and putting them into a knowledge base. So it is very hard work. And uh, luckily, I had some very good PhD students who were able to do that for, for the project. So once we have the conversion uh, definition of the needs, conversion to, proper, uh, to properties and the targets, we need the property models also. So as we talked about group contribution, group contribution is simple. If we know the groups and we can retrieve the contributions <clears throat> of the groups in a, uh, in a parameter table, then we very quickly can generate the property. So that's why it's very fast. But it is valid for the primary properties and the phase equilibrium properties, only for those two. Other applications can be quantum chemistry, where we want to do the reaction rate constant. Many applications these days for molecular design is in this area solvents and reaction synthesis, but uh, the models are not that easy. So quantum chemistry, you will hear in the invited lecture today on this one by Professor Andre Bardo. 
<clears throat> also other kinds of uh, also detailed molecular simulation, uh, molecular dynamics, molecular simulation for polymer related properties. Uh, for example, if we are using a membrane, we need to know the permeability. If we, if it is a polymeric membrane through molecular simulations, we might be able to calculate the permeability for a specific structure. And then we would be able to predict the, use the membrane for our separation process. And membrane then is the product that we want to make, polymeric membrane. And machine learning, because uh, there is a lot of data and we do not know how to connect the molecular structure to the data. So in this case, machine learning can help us to do that. And there are more and more applications in this area. So, <clears throat> so now we have the property models. And what you can see is that depending on which property model we have, we can have direct solution of the mathematical problem or indirect solution. So now I will show you the, again, the problem formulation. We have the objective function. We have the molecular product design on one side and mixture design on another side. <clears throat> For molecular design, we need to make the molecule. We give the different groups and the upper and lower bounds of the groups. In the case of mixture, we give upper and lower bounds of compounds that we will logical constraints in terms of properties we give. So the problem is that we define an objective function. We define the structural constraints. We define the property constraints and we define other constraints related to the process and product function. So in more detail, the structural constraints are these, these are the valency octet rule I showed you for the simple molecule. These are for more complex molecules. So octet rule, molecular size constraints for cyclic, bicyclic molecules, aromatic molecules. So we can generate all kinds of molecules. Then these are examples of the molecules and we need to convert them into some description so that the property prediction, which uses also the groups, can understand and predict the property. So now we have then the property constraint and the different property models that we can calculate. So these then goes into the equations. And then we have the mixture problem that uh, M is the number of compounds in the mixture. Y is the composition of that mixture. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Y is the identity of the, uh, of the ke chemical and X is the composition of the mixture. So we mathematically represent the mixture and then we need to also select that. And then we need the mixture properties and we have different kinds of mix mixing rule to calculate the mixture properties. And, and then the UNIFAC and COSMO RS now or SAC can also be converted into a group contribution model. So that's a good development. So as soon as we know the groups that are representing the molecules, we can do the group contribution. I will need five more minutes before I finish. So I'll go uh, use a little bit of my time from the previous next one. So then we can see that the problem solution steps for chemical product design and development is we define the problem, we select and de a design template. What we mean is that, as I said before, that the workflow, the steps, solution steps are the same for different problems, but the model and the data are different. So this is what we mean by the template. The template would say, do this step, do this step, do this step, and extract the corresponding model and uh, data. So for different kind of product, therefore we have made different design template. Then we solve the problem, then we verify and fine tune the solution. So in terms of defining the problem, we define the needs, translate the needs to properties and set values. In terms of select design, we have to uh, select which template for single molecule, 
for blend, for formulation, they have different uh, templates, as you will see later. To solve the problem, we have database search, we have hybrid, uh, we have uh, optimization directly using optimization technique. Hybrid means generate and test here. Then verify the solution offline, online. We can do, as I said, we combine experiments with modeling and synthesis and the methods and tools and solution steps are our pro CAPD software. And this again shows the same thing that we needed generate uh, generation of the molecule. We needed property prediction. We needed screening. So we need library of property model. We have database. We have uh, <clears throat> the method of solution. And then depending on the problem, we can decide which method we want to use in order to solve the problem. So finally, the solution strategies, you can see, we can do database search, we can do generate and test search, we can do direct solution of the mathematical problem by going to the optimization solver. We can do a decomposition based that means we solve some equations and then other equations, then other equations. That is, we break down the bigger problem into smaller sub problems and we solve one by one until we come to the center where we find, do the final solution to get the final result. Or we can do two step where we solve first a simpler problem and solve later a more detailed problem like in mixture design we can use linear mixing rules first to solve the problem. And then using the solutions, we verify the solution with the nonlinear methods. Evaluation and verification. We can go to databases and search. We can do rigorous property calculations. We can do molecular simulations. We can do other machine learning. We can do experimental verification, and then we will get the final candidate. And again, a combination integration of experiments, synthesis, and modeling is very important. <clears throat> I will skip this now, and we, I will talk about it uh, after the second lecture. This is about the software tool. You will also see a demonstration of it. And then finally, I would just say this is that we are also talking about sustainability in all cases. So which product we make, why we make, which raw material we use, uh, these are important decisions. <clears throat> As we talked about the size of the molecule, low and high, we already know this, but the higher we go in the tree, the higher is the value of the product and the size of the molecule is larger. And in order to go from one branch to a higher branch, we need a process. So at the bottom, we have the raw materials. From the raw materials, we can get some basic products and we need a process from basic product to intermediate product, we need some process. And then from there to different parts of the tree, we need different processes. Some will give us waste, some will not give us waste, some will give us good products, some will give us the same product, but with a lot of energy. So we need to do this very carefully. And what you see on the right is earth with not all, but uh, much more than 10 raw materials that uh, are available on earth resources. The only problem is that these resources are not uh, uniformly distributed. And because of that, some areas have more resources than others. And then how to find a system, sustainable way for supply chain, for product distribution, product making, and all of that, these also need to be taken into account. Okay. So with that, I finish my first part of the lecture. And we can have five minutes for, for uh, questions, or if you want a bio break, we can have a five minute bio break and then we can start again, let's say.
in five to 10 minutes. First, let's take some questions. Are there any questions? No questions at this moment? Are there any questions on the chat? No. Okay. <clears throat> so I will ask one question. Is anybody doing product design? From the participants? Um, there is someone's right. Okay. Yeah. You can uh, let him ask his question. Yes. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the first uh, uh, round of presentation. My question uh, is more related to, uh, you said you would have to break down properties of a product into something you can quantify. So let's say for purposes of adhesive, properties like tackiness, how would you break down into things that you can use in the model. Uh, I, I didn't understand uh, your last part of your question. Which so property are you talking about? So let's say for adhesives, there is like a common term called as tackiness, which is used in the industry. Yes. Uh, and then how do you break it down into things that you can put into the, let's say the CAMD? Uh, yes, uh, so there are two things. Uh, uh, so I don't remember now exactly for an adhesive, uh, what is that property, but there is a property that would tell uh, whether uh, the, the glue characteristic of the adhesive will be available or not. It is uh, to do with the surface tension and viscosity. So, so there are some correlations that are available, which will tell that according to these correlations, if the value is this, then the material will be more adhesive than another. It's the same thing like a solvent or a lubricant, because a lubricant, for example, uh, will have to absorb heat and should not be vaporized. So then the heat capacity and the heat increase, temperature specific heat increase as a function of temperature are related to that value. I hope I answered your question. Can you let him have the microphone again? The one who asked the question, can you respond? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, that answered my question. Okay. So, so I think uh, you will find, I am sure there, there is a paper that has been published on design of adhesives and they have given the list of properties. I don't remember exactly now, but you will find that they have given the the list of properties and the upper and lower bounds of properties. Okay, thank you. Any other question? This is the most difficult part of product design problem because uh, application of these methods depend on ability to convert the needs into properties and whether we have the models for properties. Okay. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be any more questions. Feel free to ask afterwards when you see more applications in the next presentation. So I will close here. And I will share the screen again for the second lecture.